Well, I want you, if you have your Bibles tonight, to turn over with, to my favorite book in the Word of God. That's the book of James. And I love James. Uh, you've heard me say before that James, or maybe you haven't, I don't know. I hadn't done a lot of work in James since I've been here, and that's probably to my shame. Uh, James um, is probably one of the most practical books in the Bible. Uh, the text today will just verify what I'm talking about. When I say practical, I mean that it's good for us today. It works in our lives today. All the Word of God does that. But it just seems like James just had a way of just uh, cutting all the fat away and just getting right down to the meat of the subject really quickly. And I want to. I want to. I want us to look at something tonight. I, I tell him, Brother Son, uh, before the service began tonight, he'd come by the office, and I struggled with the title for the message. And I, I thought maybe he'd come up with a better one, but he didn't. And so, uh, but we did have a great conversation, and um, I, I love that, and I appreciate that, brother. Brother Doug came by, and I didn't. I didn't think about even bringing that conversation up because we were talking about something else. And and uh, anyhow, I I, I want to talk about how we deal with wrong attitudes. But that's not a good title. If you if you think about now, it does have to do with our attitude. But if you think of something better I could call this, tell me after service, would you do that? Because I've got a couple up here, and I've got lines marked through them, and I've got, oh, it's a mess. you never understand it. If you looked at it, you wouldn't know what you're looking at. James, in the first chapter, down verse number 21, he said, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. That's powerful, isn't it? Um, I want to read this to you from the Good News Bible, and you'll see why in just a moment, because it gets really even plainer. Uh, than the King James. You all, you know that I always read the King James, but I want you to hear it in this version. He still got the King James up. He said, so get rid of every filthy habit. That's what he said. And all wicked conduct. The word superfluity there in the New Testament or the King James Bible means an over and abundance of wickedness. And he goes on here in the Good News Bible and he said, get rid of every filthy habit in all wicked conduct. Then he said, submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your heart, which is able to save you. I like that. I like that. I like the way that's put. And he said in the King James again, said, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, I don't know if I've dealt with this in extent here uh, before, but when you see the word meekness in the, in the Greek, terminology in the Greek times, they used to have, uh, and I've heard some old timers use this terminology, even when I was a young man, they would say, I've got a horse that I need to meek. You ever heard somebody say that? Now be careful because you're going to tell how old you are if you, if you say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, most everybody in my time we talk about they're going to break a horse. Uh, but you go back far enough, and they don't like the terminology break. Native Americans didn't want a horse that had been broken. They wanted one that had been tamed. 
Okay. Uh, King James said they wanted one that had been meek. That means that they still had that same strong spirit, but he's in control. All right? Are, are you understand? Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Isn't that what he said? What is he saying? Blessed are they that are controlled by God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not going to preach on that tonight. But I love that thought. And when I seen that word in the King James, I said, well, I want to just drop that little nugget in your mind for you to be thinking about because how many of you know that we all have times when we got to go back to being meeked again? Would you say amen? amen. Uh, I want us to look this evening at uh, and how we are to deal with many of the problems that we face, including bad attitudes. Now, I know y'all don't ever have a bad attitude. I know that. Y'all are just perfect little angels all the time, and your husband and your wife would never be able to testify that you get grumpy from time to time or you have a bad day. Who, me? Surely not. That's the thing about being married so long. There are no secrets. Uh, when you first get married, there's a lot that you don't know about one another. But then the more you get to know one another, you find out that you thought you knew them before you got married, but you really don't know them until you settle down and start living life with them. And there comes the adjusting time, uh, the time and the seasons where we learn to give and take. Uh, we learn to receive and we learn to give. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And um, I want us to look at the terminology tonight, and I think I might have dealt with this in, in something else, and I, 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 but I just want to, I wanted us to, to realize our part in this. I'm afraid that sometimes we have the mindset that we can just do what we want to do, and if God's not pleased with it, he'll come along and he'll deal with us, and he'll kind of jerk us up by the nap of the neck, and he'll correct us and whoop our britches, you know, and then we'll learn better and so on and so on. And he does do that kind of thing. Anybody here ever been taken to the woodshed by the Lord? Amen. You don't forget it, do you? Amen. If you live to be 100, you never forget it. The lesson that God taught. Brother Sean and I were talking in my office and he was talking about how that God will do that for us and he will bring things to us that we have thought for all of our lives was okay. Nothing overtly sinful about it. It didn't seem like there should be any offense to God about it or certainly no offense to nobody else about it. And yet the Holy Spirit will drop it in our heart. You need to walk away from that. Or you need to back away from that. And we don't understand it. But I asked Brother Sean, I said, isn't it amazing? Or how does it work for you the way that it has for me? You don't understand it and you struggle with it on the front end because in your mind you think, well, uh, this is not this is not a problem for anybody. It shouldn't be a problem for God. Everybody does it. This is the way I was raised up. This is what I enjoy. The scriptures are not very plain on this. And yet you feel the Holy Spirit say, walk away from it and leave it alone. And then as you obey God in the weeks and the months to come, you find out a couple of things. First of all, you hate the thing that you used to do that you thought was all right. Are, are y'all with me? And then you realize why God directed you away from such a thing. On the front end of it, now you don't see it. You see, when I say, you say, you know what I'm talking about. Whatever it may be in your life. One old black man said one time his pastor preached a message that was titled, Every Tongue, Every Tub Got to Set on Its Own Bottom. He said, you know that's in the Bible, don't you? I said, no, I don't believe I ever read that scripture where every tub got to set on its own bottom. Oh, it's in there. I know it's in there. My pastor preached about it. It's got to be in there if he preached about it. 
Well, I don't know if you know anything about the Strong's Concordance or not, but the Strong's has every word in the Bible in the Strong's Concordance. So when I got home that day, I've done me a little research, and I looked for the verse of Scripture where it said, every tub got to set on its own bottom, and it's not there. However, the principle of it is there, where it says that let every man work out his own soul salvation with fear and trembling. That's what he said. Let every tub set on its own bottom is what the man of God said. Amen? And so... Um, I like that title, by the way. Uh, but old George, he thought his pastor really was putting it down there. Where that everybody going to give an account for their own lives, and he was. But he thought it just plainly said that. Now let me just tell you something. I want you to notice a couple of things this evening. And I, Lord God, help us tonight because this is, um, This can be pretty strong, and I, and I don't want you to leave here and think, ooh, that's too much for tonight. But I, I, I do want us to see, I want you to pay attention to those little words where, uh, where James said, lay aside, in the King James, lay aside. Now, if you, if you, if you look those words up, uh, Brother Son, I copied that off that I was telling you that part of that commentary and left it on my printer. How's that for using it in my sermon tonight? But um, I, will, I will say you, uh, to you tonight where he said, lay aside all filthiness. That is the only place in the New Testament that word is used. I told Brother Son, I said, whenever I find that in my studies, I always want to pay attention to what he's saying because I love the way that the writers of the Scripture overlapped one another. They would use some of the same terminology. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And yet here's James using a word that nobody has used before him in New Testament times, which got mine and Brother Son's mind to roaming a little bit back there in the office. And so I've done a little research and I got to thinking, is he talking about the same thing where Isaiah the prophet said that our righteousness is as filthy rags and our iniquities have carried us away from God. And I went over there and looked and I couldn't put the pieces together. I told Brother Son, I said, this is too deep for right now. I don't have time. And besides, I done got my message laid aside. But you see, that's the way the Word of God does us. And whenever you see that and you find out that nobody else has used that, Brother Kenny kind of gets you to wonder, don't he? Amen. By the way, I love Brother Kenny because Brother Kenny will, he'll come up to you and he'll talk about my thought processes. I love that. If you don't know it, that just simply means something that God has dropped in Brother Kenny's heart and mind. That's why. And he expresses my thought processes today is this or that or the other. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Uh, Brother Kenny, I'm putting a plug in for you. Are you, you see, because that's just how God does. And so mine and brother Sean's thought processes came to a screeching halt about that word. But we do know that that's the only place here in James 1, 21, that that word is used. And so I'm not going to be able to delve too much into that, but I'm going to tell you something this evening. I do like what he says when he says lay aside or lay apart. Uh, it means a way to place something away. It means to lay something down. Now, when you put those two words together, it means that it's something that's not good for you and you take it and you lay it down and while you're in the process of laying it down, you're pushing it away from you out of your reach. Huh? <laughs> An example of that is since Thanksgiving is coming up, uh, an example of, of that is a person who's about to sinfully indulge in eating too much pie. Huh? He knows it's good. And he knows that he shouldn't. And about the time that he's ready to reach for it, 
he comes to himself. Y'all see what I'm saying? He takes it, he looks at it, and he lays it down, and as he sets it on the table, he pushes it away. Now, if your name is Kenneth Pack, you're like the Beverly Hillbillies in that episode where they were eating at that fancy dining table, and they got those pot pushers there. Now, we know them as pool cues in our day and time, but those pot pushers, according to Jed, is so you can push the pot and serve somebody on the other side of the fancy dining table, which is a pool table. So if your name is Kenneth Pack and you've realized that you don't need that piece of pie, you put it down and you push it away and you get it out of your reach and if you've got a pot pusher handy, you better push it away with that and then throw the pot pusher away. Somebody say amen right there. Now James is speaking here and he's told us in our text tonight, he said, now this is what I want you to learn to do. I want you to lay that filthiness down, okay? That filthy habit, all that wicked conduct, I want you to lay it down and I want you to push it away from you and, and I want you to get shed of it. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to, to, to deliberately shove it away from yourself lest you overindulge. Are, y'all, are you hearing what I'm saying? Now that's the idea of that word that James uses when he tells us to lay apart all the filthiness in our lives. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Pastor, I ain't got no filthiness in my life. Well... I don't think I do either. I, uh, when we was on our Branson trip up there, we went up to the, what's it called, Sister Jeannie, where we carried the kids to eat the country, country what? Country something. It's a big thing on the boulevard there that's got a big old huge buffet. Country buffet. Amen. And they wanted, to, you know, they wanted to go. So we went, and uh, we eat a fairly decent meal. And I uh, noticed that they had some bread pudding up there on the dessert thing. Now some folks make good bread pudding, and some folks don't need to make bread pudding. Okay. Uh, those folks know how to make bread pudding, and it was a good sign because. I seen it and it didn't look like bread pudding. It just looked like it was just a bunch of gobbledygook there and most of it was gone and the pan was starting to shine on the bottom. And I said, oh, that's gotta be good right there. Some of them other pies and cakes were not even touched, but the bread pudding was almost gone. Now that's a good sign. Are y'all, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So my wife said, I'm gonna go up and get me some dessert. I said, swing by there and bring me some bread pudding. Amen. Now her friend likes bread pudding too. And she went to get her some bread pudding. And when she come back, she had a plate with nothing on it but bread pudding. My wife come back with a little (laughs) portion. I didn't have to put it down and shove it away. She didn't overindulge me one bit. So I sat there and I watched her friend eat all of that on her plate and I'm thinking, surely that little bitty woman can't eat all that bread pudding and she's going to want somebody to help her eat it and I'm going to volunteer. (laughs) Are you hearing what I'm saying? But you see, he said there, he said, I want you to take all the filthy habits, all the wrongdoing in your life, everything that's wicked in your life, I want you to put it down and I want you to push it away from yourself. And again, when we stop and we look at our lives, we think, Pastor, I've I've been clean. I I mean, I'm doing my best to work, walk in holiness. I'm doing my best to be a righteous person. And Brother Sean brought up the point back there in our discussion. He said, I wonder 
when we stand before the Lord, if there's anything that he's going to look at, he's going to say, I wish you to push that away. I wish you to left that alone. Are y'all, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because see, there's a lot of things that we think are innocent. All right? But yet, when God sees it, what does he see? And so, uh, this, this terminology, this thought, in the New Testament times, the word was also used to describe somebody taking off his dirty clothes at the end of the day. Paul loved this word. He used this word in Romans 13 and 12 when he said, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Amen. So Paul said there's a, there's a process that we take off the works of darkness and we put on the armor of light. Amen. Now he didn't say God was going to do that. He said we're going to do that. You see, I go back to what I said a while ago. We sit around, God's going to do all, no, 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 no. God saves us. He sanctifies us. He fills us with his spirit. He gives us his word. And he said, now I want you to be sensitive and hear my voice. And when I say for you to do something, I want you to take it off and get rid of it. Now, how many of you guys have ever, ever had a shirt? that you loved wearing. I'm not talking about to church, ladies. I'm just talking about a round-the-house shirt. My buddy gave me, years ago, one of those old Spanish shirts. It's got the, it wasn't ruffles, it was just trim down garbanzo or something like that shirt. It had pockets up here and it had pockets down here in the front, it's kind of like a doctor's smock. You know what I'm talking about when I say that? It was white. It was very dressy. I love those shirts. He gave me one, and I wore it out. I, I, I mean, the pocket was all tore up, so I just tore the pocket off. The sleeves got all tattered, so I just cut the sleeves out of it, and I'd wear it. I'd wear it around the house. I'd, I'd wear it doing chores. I just wore it sitting around the house watching television. My wife, you could absolutely read a newspaper. It wore so thin. And my wife hated that shirt. Why do you want to wear that old shirt that's wore out? And I said, well, first of all, it's comfortable. It's big. It's loose fitting. And second of all, my friend gave it to me. I don't care who gave it to you. That's ugly, and you ought not to wear that. That's not becoming of you. Like I give a rip. I'm not going out. I didn't even go to McDonald's in my shirt. I'm not going anywhere. If you come to my house and I got that shirt on, that's your problem if you don't like it. Y'all seeing what I'm saying? My wife would say, I got, I, I got something I need you to do. And I said, what's that? I need you to take that shirt off and throw it in the trash. And I couldn't do it. I don't know what happened to my shirt, but I got a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> now you guys, listen, there ain't a man in the house don't know that's wrong right there. That's wrong. That's just all it is to it. <laughs> but see, she's, she's, and she comes along and she'll give you these scriptures. Now, Paul said, cast that nastiness away and put on the garment of light. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's bad when they try to use scripture and they take it out of context. Are you, but Paul used that in, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 8. He said, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Put that off. And then he talks putting on the new man. Amen. In Ephesians he says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man. And he's not just talking about your speech there. He's talking about your way of life. Put off the old way of life the, the, with the old man 
which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So how do you deal with your dirty clothes at the end of the day? And when I get home tonight, I'm going to take this shirt off, shake it out, and hang it up in the closet and wear it again before my wife washes it because I'm sweating. I'm not perspiring. I'm sweating. Okay? And you don't re-wear dirty clothes. Are y'all with me? So what you do with dirty clothes at the end of the day, you take them off and you put them away in the clothes hamper so they can be washed. James uses the same illustration to explain how we must deal with our actions and our attitudes in our own life. Now I'm telling you folks, if God lays his hand on me and God says, Kenneth, I want you to quit doing so and so and I don't, Trust me, it's going to have an effect on my attitude. Okay? It's going to have an effect on my life. It's going to have an effect on the way that I relate to you. Are you understand what I'm saying? You can always tell if somebody had a fuss on the way to church. My wife and I, I mean, used to, we go all week long, never have a crossword, get up on Sunday morning, trying to get ready to go to church. And if there's going to be a fuss head that week, it's going to be on Sunday morning. And I finally told her, I said, honey, we got to recognize the trick of the devil here. I said, because uh, we're going in there to do ministry, and the enemy knows that. And if we got this mess on our minds... The Bible said, don't let your son go down on your wrath. Have you ever been up at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to work things out that you know you should have had worked out before you went to bed at 9 o'clock? Been there and done that too. My wife said, "Uh, uh, we'll deal with it tomorrow. I said, no, 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 we got to deal before we go to bed. I love it when I can use scripture on her, Brother Keeney. Y'all understand what I'm trying to say? See, there's things in our life that just comes in unawares and it just creeps in. I said it this morning, we're living too close to the coming of the Lord and we need to examine ourselves and see if we're in the faith or not. And then they tell us how that we are to deal with this stuff, okay? You got to decide to get rid of those bad habits, I was uh, talking to my dad one time. He used to smoke, and when he drove a truck, he smoked. Been a long time since he smoked anything. He said, I'll never forget when God dealt with me about it. He said, I just bought a brand new pack. And he said, I thought, well, Lord, I'll smoke this pack, and I won't get no more. And he said, the Lord spoke to me if he ever has spoke to me. And he said, no, it's now or never. Brother Son, now or never. How many of you know that God will bring us to that point? You either make your mind up now or it's not going to be ever. Huh? There's a time when he won't knock anymore. There's a time when he won't call your name anymore. If you live in rebellion in a constant state of rebellion, his word said, he that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be cut off in that. You hear that? Now let me uh, let me just let me just bring this thing to a close by just bringing this last thing I wanted to share with you out. Uh, y'all realize that I'm working real hard on my time on my sermons. Y'all realize that? That's a good place to say, "Amen, Pastor," and we appreciate it too. Pastor Appreciation Month is gone, baby. I'm teasing teasing y'all. Now, I want you to realize something about those dirty clothes. They don't just fall off your body. They don't just do that. My daughter, when we pastored down south Louisiana, I had an older gentleman in the church that he and I had done a lot of the maintenance work around the church. I was a lot younger then. I didn't know any more than I do now, but I was a good gopher. And I could go and I would help him and I would dig and I would help him. I 
would do whatever I could do to help him. And one day we were working on water line or something around there, and I had my old overalls on. I just love them because you don't have to go around tugging at them all the time. They just hang there, mind their own business, don't they, Brother Doug? I like that. And uh, so uh, uh, I was went into the house, and I had to pick up my keys or something. My wife said, where are you going? Our daughter was there, and I said, well, me and Brother Hitchcock, we're going to town. We're going up here to the hardware store. we got to get some pieces to fix this pipe so we can get the water back on at the church. And my daughter looked at me, and I was sweaty, grimy, nasty. And she said, Dad, you're not going to town looking like that. I knew what she was meaning, Sister Be- I mean, uh, 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 Sister Judy, and I made the statement. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going just like this. And I told her, I told her, Mama, I said, baby, go in and get a piece of paper and get a red marker and write on there, I am Stephanie Pack's dad, and stick it on my back. <laughs> of course, Sister Pack didn't do that, but Stephanie rolled them big old blue eyes at me and walked off in her bedroom. I can't believe you're going to town looking like you look. I said, baby, I've got to finish working when I get back. I'm not going to go clean up, change clothes, go to the hardware store, and then come back and change back into my work clothes. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, those clothes came off, but they didn't just fall off. And what the Scripture is telling us, many Christians depend on that to happen in their life, just automatically it just falls off. It just falls away. And there are a lot of things that do fall off when we give our heart to God. And I'm so glad. Y'all remember Merle Haggard? Now, if you like country music, Merle Haggard was the best has ever been. He just, he... He talked about a song that he wrote one time called Mama Tried. And in that song was the jest that his mama tried to raise him right. But he refused to accept her counsel. But it was not mama's fault because mama tried. Y'all remember the song? And in that song, he was of the opinion that mom was just kind of an overzealot or something. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, but he wound up in prison because he didn't take counsel. You see what I'm saying? Um, So when James tells us to lay apart all the filthiness from our life, he's telling us, to first acknowledge it, that what's wrong, it's wrong, and then to take actions and measure to remove those things from our lives. If you're going to get free and stay free, this has to happen, and it don't happen by accident. And we can't just be satisfied when we get up out of the altar and say, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from this or that or the other. Now, I grew up around folks that knew how to cuss, But I'm so grateful. When I got up out of that altar, all that mess was gone. It was just gone. I I don't know how. It it was just gone. I no longer had the desire to talk like that. I no longer had the... I hated to be around people that couldn't talk without using those foul, vulgar words. All of a sudden, the alcohol that had been such a major part of my life, I hated being around a drunk. You see what I'm saying? God had taken that stuff away from me. That doesn't mean that there hadn't been other issues that I've had to deal with in my life, and I had to take them off myself. And this is what the Word of God is teaching us. There's areas in our life where God lays His hand on us and says, okay, that's filthy, that's nasty. Now that word filthiness there, I do remember this with the commentator that I got back there on my printer. Thank you. Having one of them evenings, just bear with me. It was not just like dirtiness. It was vulgarity. It was odious. 
It was nastiness. You see what I'm saying? Do away with that stuff. And it led itself, now Brother Son, you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have, the, don't have that here, but man, that would be good. And it doesn't have the connotation that I've shared so far with us. You can interpret the scripture this way. You must make the choice to remove those filthy, stinking garments from your life, to permanently lay them down and deliberately push them out of your range forever and forever. And too many of us are like the little boy in the Sunday school class when the Sunday school teacher said, what is a lie? Does anybody know what a lie is? And the little boy raised, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. And she said, Johnny, what is a lie? And Johnny said, well, a lie is an abomination unto God and a very present help in the time of need. Brother Chuck, I believe, I believe I pastored Johnny a few times. I remember some years ago, and I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to wrap it up. This is my last illustration. Some years ago, I had a pastor friend of mine, my wife and I, had a preacher in his church, in his congregation, who'd never learned good hygiene. There are times, let me just pause right here to say this. There are times when my wife gets so irate with me because I've got a bad habit of just inviting folks on a whim to come into the house. She don't like that because she hadn't had time to put things up and all of that. And I told her, I said, honey, it looks like a cyclone come through here all the time, so don't worry about it. That didn't go over good. But I wasn't meaning about her cleanliness. We got a little old dog in there that don't know he's a dog, and we pick his toys up, and he'll go over there and tip the bucket over and start dragging them out again. He loves them squeaky toys, and I get up, and I won't pay no attention. And all of a sudden, I step on a squeaky toy, and it just squeaks. And I'm thinking, my God, I stepped on that stupid dog. And I just about break my back trying to get off of the thing, and it ain't nothing but his toy. (laughs) Now, if he was a little boy, I'd say, Johnny, get this toy up out of this floor. And you tell Toby that, he just looks at you like, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play, and his tail's doing 90 miles an hour. (laughs) Are y'all getting the point? This friend of mine, though, he had this preacher in his church. It came to the point in his mind that he wanted to go and try out for another church. This pastor friend of mine called the superintendent. (laughs) And he said to the superintendent, so-and-so is wanting to try out for this church. The superintendent knew him. They had had conversations about him before. And the superintendent told his friend of mine, this pastor, he said, I want you to clean up this family. He said, what do you mean clean them up? He said, I want you to go to town. I want you to buy soap and deodorant. I want you to take them to town, buy him a suit of clothes, buy her a new dress, some new shoes, get the kids some new clothes. I want them to look good when they go try for that church. (laughs) This buddy of mine said, I met with my deacons and I told them what the superintendent wanted us to do. They agreed. He said to me, he said, Kenneth, what do you think? I said, I don't think y'all done right. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think the superintendent was wrong and I think y'all made a bad decision. I said, let me ask you the question. I said, uh, You bought toothpaste, toothbrushes, hair brushes, combs, perfume, deodorant. Oh, yeah, we've done all that. 
give them kind of like a shower, a pounding. He and the church did this only to find out that they returned to their old way of living. Not bathing, not combing their hair, dirty clothes. They put those old clothes on back when they first would get out of the shower and perfume and extra everything else. And I said to my friend, I said, now, did they get the church when they went and tried out? He said, no, they didn't. I said, well, thank you, Jesus. You say, Pastor, it wasn't none of your, you're right, it wasn't none of my business. But it was a in, it was an injustice to that group of people that would see him dressed to the nines on tryout day, and then come in the next Sunday looking like he worked at the city dump. You say, "What is that guy?" I'm, I'm telling you, if God is allowed to work in our lives, there are things that we will pull off Amen. and replace Amen. that the world will see who it is that we represent. Amen. My wife and I have a standing situation with this family. They were, they were good people, but they didn't know nothing about hygiene, nothing at all. Many Christians do the same thing. Jesus' blood cleanses them from all sin and they receive a new robe of righteousness only to go back and pick up the same old dirty clothes and put them back on again and go back through the same old motions. And God said, no, 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 no. That's not the way you do. I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, I believe the church needs to start teaching on sanctification again. You hear what I'm saying now? Now, the church of God, my friends, the church of God, they believe sanctification is a definite work of grace. I believe that it is a definite and yet progressive work. All right? There's a problem in our church world today, in, the, in those that are not church of God, that we act like that it's just an automatic thing. But you got to get in something before you can grow in it. That's why I agree with the church of God. There's too many of us trying to grow in something we hadn't even got into yet. You ask the church of God, what's your relationship? Oh, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm full of the Holy Ghost, and I'm on my way to heaven. Somebody shout amen. There's a lot of folks, though, that still pick up those old garments, isn't it? And revert back to type and go back. They've been around that foul language. They've been around that stuff too long, and they just can't leave it alone. They can't lay it down. And the next thing you know, they justify it saying, it's really not all that bad, Brother Son. Everybody else is doing it, so it's okay. And God's trying to say, no, no, no. I want you to leave that alone. I want you to walk away from that. But if we don't listen to him, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? If we don't listen to him, then we enter into rebellion, and we start piling on that old mess. And when we do... It's not just the dirty clothes. It's not just, the, it's not just the inappropriate behavior. It's all the attitude that comes with it. And the next thing you know, somebody looks at you wrong and you're snapping at them. And you don't know why you're snapping at them. They're looking at you like, what are you doing looking like that and talking like that? Teaching Sunday school in our church on Sunday. They ain't got no business to talk to me like that. Who do they think they are? They're not God. Because we live in a society today that wants to be left alone to do whatever it is that they want to do. Most people, Brother Kenny, would look at this message tonight and they would say, that preacher is meddling in an old time way. Go back to the basics. Didn't, didn't, 
didn't Brother Doug tell us that the other night? It's time to go back to the basics. It, what do you say? Don't mess with those ancient landmarks. Those things that brought us here need to be preached and propagated in our church today. Even when people don't want to hear it. I'm going to close because there's just so much good stuff comes to my mind. I, and I'll be honest with you, some of it's not very becoming to me. I, I went to our first church and we were there 11 months. I don't even put it on my resume anymore. God did some wonderful things in the 11 months that we were there. People were filled with the Holy Ghost, joined the church. Attendance was up. Salvations were up. Baptism of the Holy Ghost was up. Everything was going good. And then the former pastor wanted to go back, and he talked to some of the key people in the church, and the next thing I know, I'm loading the U-Haul, leaving. 11 months later, left on a Thursday. He was in the pulpit on Sunday. But while I was there, I ran into, it was a little community, and there was, had a little grocery store, really a nice grocery store uptown. And I went into that grocery store to, to pick up something. Sister Pack had sent me on an errand, and I went to get it. And I walked in the door, and there was one of my deacons. <laughs> had him a cigarette about that long. He turned around, he caught me, and he was hoping he didn't, I didn't see him. And he took that cigarette and he cuffed it in his hand like that and run it down his pocket like that. <laughs> Me being the... <sighs> Thank you, Sister Judy. I couldn't help it. Flip Wilson said the devil made me do it. It had to be the devil. Brother, Brother Doug, I just walked right up to where he was at. And I extended my hand to shake his hand. He wouldn't shake my hand. I said, how you doing, brother? And we got to talk. He kept, well, I got to go, my wife. And all the time, he didn't know, but there was looked like a teepee right behind his arm. A trail of smoke coming up behind his head. Sister Renee, he never knew it. I stood there, and I was wondering how hot the cigarette was getting on the inside of his britches. And I just kept talking and talking and talking. <laughs> I know, that wasn't right. That wasn't right, I know. Uh, you got to remember, that was my first church, and I didn't have no sense. I was full of foolishness back in those days. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I couldn't wait till I got back home. I got back home. My wife said, what took you so long? Oh, I ran into brother so-and-so. And you've been going almost an hour to pick up this one thing. I'm waiting on you. And I told her, I said, baby, I had fun while I was gone. She said, what did you do? And when I told her, Brother Kenny, she didn't think, she didn't see the humor in it. <laughs> For a long time, she didn't see the humor in it, but she does now. So every time I tell this story, she laughs because she sees what I saw all those years ago. It was so funny. <laughs> uh, well, somebody said, what'd you do with that smoking deacon? I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I work what I got when I get there. I'll deal with it in time, but I ain't do nothing. He didn't stay around long. I guess he figured out that TP was running up the back of his arm. He never said nothing to me about it. I never said nothing to him about it. It was just, I mean, we're funny people. Aren't we funny? That's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny right there. But I mean, we're guilty of that kind of stuff. You know, we don't want nobody to know that, so we just kind of cuff that thing and hide it. And all the time, it's giving us away the whole time. That attitude is rare and it's ugly. Head. Nobody knows it, but oh, yes, they do. They do. 
Jealousy? Oh, Jesus. Got to quit. Good. Give it to me when this is over with. Ladies and gentlemen, what a blessing it is to live for him. God loves us too much to leave us where he found us. And I'm so glad that I'm not near the person that I was when he saved me.